friends, now we are God's children, and it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we'll see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion, and sin is rebellion. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Every person who remains in relationship to him does not sin. Any person who sins has not seen him or known him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The person who practices righteousness is righteous in the same way that Jesus is righteous. He ends the reading of the day. Thanks be to God. In today's scripture reading, um, we read uh, uh, two or three or four times John refers to the people he's writing to as the children of God. It starts out, see what love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. So now do you think he was writing to a group of um, second graders? Maybe. Is that what you, do you think that? What do you think? Do you think he was writing to young folks or to full grown folks? Both. That's a very good answer. That's right. He was writing to this whole community which had both in it. And he's calling them all children of God. Now look out there. Those are the not second graders out there, right? <laughs> Do they look like children to you? No, not, not to Chris. No, they don't. Oh, me? <laughs> Are they all somebody's children? Okay. Tricky, isn't it? They are children, but they don't look like children. Sneaky adults. <laughs> John seems to believe that all of us are not only children of God, but all of us are in this stage of life where we're growing and learning. Raise your hand if you are not growing or learning. Okay, nobody admitted it at least. So we are all growing, we're still learning how to live life. We'll, we're still learning how to love. We're still learning how to really see, how to live our lives in truth. How to be free, how to live in community. And I'm somewhat passionate about you understanding this because I know I spend a lot of the rest of my week saying like, you haven't cleaned your room yet? I asked you 45 minutes ago to just clean up that one little spot. <laughs> we often in the adult world want you to like step up and be more adultish. And there is a place for that. But I would also like there to be at least one place, and for church to be one of those places where we all remember together. Because of God's love, I am a child of God. Which means I am learning over and over again how to be a person of love. How to be a person of life. And that I am no farther along that path, or I am no less of a child than you are, or you are, or you are, or you are. So let's be children of God together. Let's pray. God, it's 
towards your children and we're knocking on the door. And so please open it to us today and help us to open our hearts to you that we might live in love together. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Holy Spirit, in this holy moment, we ask for you to be in charge, and we will follow you, trusting that your direction leads to peace. And together, all of God's children say, Well, just to follow up on what Phil just said, I'd like to see a show of hands if anybody had any, uh, did anybody experience any learning this week? Anyone? <laughs> Learn. Learn. Anybody experience any learning this morning? Yeah. <laughs> Pesky life. next few weeks, for these first six weeks after Easter, I think it's six weeks, we're looking at uh, the writings, the letters of John, the first John. Um, and Phil did such a great job kind of even giving us a context of how to um, hear John that I wanted just to kind of do a quick recap of what Phil did last week. That really, the Gospel of John, the first, th the three letters of John, and uh, the Revelation are kind of coming out of that Johannian school of thought. So whether it was actually the uh, disciple John or the school of John that followed him um, that wrote these, but they're very similar in context. Uh, as we were approaching Easter, one of the ideas of the context of now um, in this, when Jesus has said in his synoptic, or in his uh, synopsis of what his message is, now is the time, the kingdom of God um, is here, change your heart and mind and trust, that we were really focusing on this idea of now, this idea of time. Um, and we have said before that who God is, um, is not limited to our understanding of both time you know, we function on a time of our wristwatches, um, but really, uh, God is not bound to, limited to um, our, our neat and orderly time. And what's so great about the Johannian school that we're going to be focusing on or hearing in our texts over these next few weeks is God is not even limited to space. Because... And this is almost, if you can make this hurdle with me this morning, um, it's almost like this is where the most important work is. Is that somehow, for the writers of John, John knows that what is most true is the kingdom of God. That God's realm is in, in existence at all times. And that um, somehow, in this human experience, overlaid onto God's kingdom is also this human existence. And so the writers of John are dealing with space. They talk about place as which place are you anchoring yourself in? Which world are you um, aware of? Are you in the realm of God, which is at all times, in all places, in all spaces, or are you oriented to the human story, place, world? Because for the writers of John, um, the human story places, which are very concrete, have definite boundaries. I am here. Brian is there, um, that there's very distinct otherness, but somehow the writers of John know that God isn't limited to our limits. That is, a God permeates, is in immediacy to everything, and that there's no boundaries. Okay, so let me just um, pause.
pause there because that in itself could be the sermon. That is such a revolutionary um, mind bender um, that it takes some while to get reoriented to that. That God is not limited to our definitions of space. Okay. Anybody want to argue with me on that? commentary. So then let's unpack. Even as I was going through um, the verses of John that Ingrid read for us today, I don't, I just want to demonstrate how the writers are actually believe this. And so I'm, it's, we have seven verses. I just want to unpack them. And Ingrid started with this. This, this is what our text today said. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, and that we should be called God's children, and that is what we are. Because the world didn't recognize him, it doesn't recognize us. We are God's children, and that is what we are. So again, it is... Um, this idea of where is your starting point? Is your starting point your inherent um, childness of God? Or, it, or do you enter your day as mother, as partner, as profession, as community person, as worrier? Where do you orient to yourself? How do, you, how do you think of yourself right now? The world, um, our anchoring spot is God's children. In some ways, what Phil didn't say to the kids is, as children, as human children, from the John perspective, they've already arrived. And the ones who are actually um, in the trying to get somewhere place are the adults who are actually trying to return back to childness. In some ways, we have seen the pinnacle of evolution. Like that's where we're trying to get to. The Nicodemus story, trying to get back to be born again, to be go back into the womb, to kind of um, reclaim our childlessness. And because the world doesn't recognize that this purity is where we're going, the world, they don't recognize God's world. They only see the world that they have constructed that has importance of things like acquiring money, acquiring a good profession, making sure you're safe, protected, being liked, putting your game face on. It seems to me um, one of the important, play, one of the most important things that we hold for each other coming together in this community of faith is that we, first off, recognize each other. Not as the stories we tell of each other or the stories that we um, hear about each other, but first off, recognizing our inherent childness. That I believe each of you is child of God. And really, that's where the story stops. And because we happen to be also functioning in this world, that tells us so many other things about ourselves. That when we come together in church, it allows us to untangle so that we can have this hope of a resting. Hope.
hope of not having to achieve anymore, hope of not having to earn our place, but simply remembering that we already are ch children of God. We are already beloved. Okay, so that's just in the first verse. <laughs> Already, do you see how the writer is already unpacking these two different worlds? Um, and that's essentially what the writers are saying. There are two worlds functioning at every moment. It goes on, verse 2. Dear friends, now we are God's children. That is our starting point. And it hasn't yet appeared what we will be. We don't, we don't need to go even beyond that. We know, the writer says, that when he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. When we inhabit this world is when we get a shot of glimpsing God. We'll get to see who God is in this realm. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I love this idea. This idea that um, we'll get to see God and because there is this, that is our first glimpse. That is the purest way of vision. Um, not using the lens of this world. But when we inhabit this world, it is so pure. It is so um, we don't even need to d distill it out anymore. We don't need to filter this because it simply is God's realm. Then verse 4 says, Every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion, and sin is rebellion. In some ways, it seems like the writer is saying that sin is believing that this world that is superimposed on God's world is the only world. That's the rebellion, yep. believing that this is all there is. Sleep, being asleep, forgetting, forgetfulness is the sin because we are rebelling to believe what is already true. It's a much different understanding of sin. You know, verse 5 says, that he appeared to take away sins and that there is no sin in him. So here in God's realm, there is no sin. So somehow there is a place where we get to live and inhabit that also has within us the no sinness. <laughs> is that a word? Um, non sin Every person, verse 6 says, who remains in relationship to him does not sin. Any person who sins has not seen him or know him. It seems like the writers were suggesting that the sin functions at this world, but in this world of God's realm, there is purity, there is sinlessness. So again, When our worlds combine, we have within us both this place of purity of no sinfulness and also this, this ability to sin. Oh my gosh, how can that be? <laughs> that is the human thing, right? So then where do you anchor yourself is what the writer says. And then he simply closes out with this. Verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. Make sure nobody tells you this is all there is. Don't believe the advertisements you read. Don't listen and believe as gospel truth that having a good retirement plan is going to get you there. The person
person who practices righteousness, the person who dwells in the realm of God, in the space of God, is righteous in the same way that Jesus is righteous. That's what Easter was about. The fact that as Jesus was being crucified, Jesus still inhabited God's kingdom, even on the cross. Jesus was awake to the fact that God's realm was already underway in that moment. Like Frank said, though our resurrection happens when we're awake, when we are present in the now, and remember that as well. So there are these two realms. We talked about time in Lent, and in the Easter season, there are texts about space. Now it occurred to me that I could leave it there and say that you all, I mean, just start noticing for yourselves through this week, um, where do you see the kingdom of God breaking through? Um, but it's also true that as I was holding the sermon in my prayer um, about what I have to say, I was also nudged to say something else, which is, It has not been my particular experience of anchoring into God's realm that leads me to a path of happy, happy, happy. <laughs> um, this particular week, I have had three particular situations that have unfolded that have been, um, has had pretty significant bumps in my, in my agenda as well as, um, as I hold it in my prayers, have a certain amount of grief that come with them. Mm -hmm. And somehow, um, I don't hear this realm as inviting us to a path of happy, happy, happy. I hear the realm and the kingdom of God as an invitation to be real, and authentic and brave. So that no matter what gets laid onto this experience, we're just kind of more able to stay forward um, and be present and navigate both what is and hold true to like, oh, like this is painful. Um, some paths to Christianity tell you that if you do certain prayers, you get to acquire a lot of things. <laughs> what is that, Jabez? Prayer, the prayer of Jabez, or whatever that one is like, oh, pray for this certain thing, you get that. Um, other ones are, you know, like how to influence people. <laughs> um, I just never see Jesus saying any of that. I just see Jesus saying, anchor yourself in God. Because no matter what unfolds, it will break through. So people of God, that is my invitation.
this difference between the way that J Julie and I naturally um, approach the world. And so I'm not wanting to um, mess up Julie's invitation to you. Ju Julie has the heart of a spiritual director where she is going to ask you to notice and she's going to trust you. Um, I, I have the heart of a cynical cattle rustler. Football coach. Football coach. I am going to tell you how to do it. And you better do it. Or you do a whole bunch of push-ups. So I, I really mean this as an, as an invitation to, um, to notice. But sometimes to notice, you have to know what you're looking for. And this world, which is actually a big lie. Amen. Right? It's a big blank. It seems so small. It is how we have organized our whole lives, but it's a big blank. It is not nearly as real. And every once in a while, we make a mistake at church, and we feed the wrong wolf. You know that old Native American story? We all have two wolves inside of us, and there's the wolf of, of greed and lies um, and deceit, and there's the wolf of, of life uh, and love and community. And the little boy asks his grandfather, well, wolf, which wolf wins? And Grandpa says, the wolf you feed. And every once in a while we come to church and we, and we pray and we think of all the worst things we can think of. And we are praying for God's grace and love, but we say, oh, what feels really real to us is this awful thing. And what feels really real to us is this awful thing. And we see in the Psalms, David is not afraid to bring the awful things to God. Absolutely. But today for our prayer, and I don't know how we're going to do it either. <laughs> Let's just rest in this. Partly as, a, as an attempt to feed this wolf. As, a, as an attempt to feed this side of ourselves. So that when we go out into that very real rest of our lives, we can at least kind of take this image. And we know that in some ways there are even opposites. We could, you know, last week I had the opposites written up here, if you remember. <laughs> but in some ways, no, what's only true, and this is what we're going to pray in just a minute, what's only true is life, what's only true is love, what's only true is community, what's only true is abundance, what's only true is forgiveness. Open the eyes of our heart so that we might step into this reality right now with the full complexity of our lives we remember God that the only thing that's really true is life the only thing that's really true is love The only thing that's really true is light. God, when we read the newspaper or hear the news or open up our web browser, remember that the only thing that's true is we are all children of God, for that is who we are. God, when my, um, my inner voices come in to remind me Either how absolutely fantastic and world-changing I am, or what a mess I make out of everything that you have already given me everything I need. Mm. That you surround my heart with life and love every minute. God, when I blow it and I say the exact wrong thing to the exact wrong person, God, remind me, all there is is forgiveness. All there is is grace. 
God, when I am feeling anxious and afraid because I know there's not enough, there's not enough time, there's not enough money, there's not enough people stepping up, there's not enough people who agree with me, God, remember that all there is. Help me remember. Help us remember that gratitude is all there is. God, you are so good. You are so holy. And you have proclaimed what's real and what's not real. So this week, God, open the eyes of our hearts that we might see. And now hear us as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.